kind of going into is infectious diseases. Infectious diseases, like maybe we should try and focus on like diagnostic testing. So what is PCR? What is sensitivity specificity? Rather than do like the specific, like small infectious diseases. And maybe if you guys that are sitting memberships can think of like two hot topics or something like that, that you think, sorry. Excuse me, sorry. Um, uh, that you think might be kind of examinable, like things like Ehrlichia that have just kind of been yeah. emerging in New South Wales, like maybe we could cover that and something else plus some diagnostic testing discussion for next week. That'd be amazing actually, because yeah. I've written down, I've got a list of things that I think might pop up and that is Ehrlichia is something I don't know anything about and I really want to know a lot about going into this exam, so. Okay. Um, and I, it's good to review that sensitivity and specificity for me as well because it's easy to throw those terms around, like specific is such a common word that we use, but making sure that we're using it correctly. Um, so we'll do sensitivity, specificity, the types of PCR testing. So we'll cover what an ELISA is, what a PCR is and things like that for infectious diseases. Um, how antibody responses are generated, how long it takes for antibody responses to be present. Um, PCR, Eliza. Okay, so that's the agenda for next fortnight. So I'll send that around. So, um, Danielle, if you're listening, we are going to change the order of um, subjects that I've told you just for these guys doing memberships. And then next week we'll talk about what you want to talk about the week after, but that's getting really close to exams, actually. What date are exams? The first or two. Oh, okay. So we've only got one more before exams. So let's just... Do that and then yeah we might give you guys a week off after exams what do you reckon nah. yeah, maybe. <laughs> oh, okay. it's all really helpful so i'm not too fast to be honest. Yeah. okay all right well, I'll, I, won't, I, can... I won't hassle you if you haven't read the chapters well the week after i think we'll be we'll be cramming for oral exams so if there's any kind of great like ecgs maybe or something like that would be oh good. that's a really good idea okay so we might do some radiographs ultrasound images ecgs like the sort of things that you would get in an exam yeah. okay and i'll just do random i won't tell you what subjects we're going to do oh great that'd be great okay <laughs> that'd be fun. We'll do a really public practice oral exam <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> youtube um, all right, so um, these chapters were starting on um, thrombocytopenia and just dis primary dysfunction of primary hemostasis. What does primary hemostasis mean? Uh, it's formation of the platelet plug. Right, Excellent. right. Yeah. What is the, the defect? Oh, so. Sorry, I, did, I saw you put up three fingers. What are the three things that um, are required for a plate that plug to form? Oh, um, for, like von Willebrand's factor. Excellent. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, uh, adequate platelets. Yes. And functioning platelets. Yes, I will put platelets in oh, one, one. Three, and then there's one more. Yeah, is it exposure of tissue factor essentially yeah so it's the interaction with the endothelium so you can't form a plate plug unless you've got endothelium there and i guess the other thing that potentially might impact hemostasis would be the presence of functional endothelial cells and things so um they're the three reasons why you might get sort of local ecchymoses or um petechiae which are much more common as presenting signs for dis disorders of primary hemostasis. Um, so obviously IMTP is the biggest topic in here, but let's talk a little bit about platelet physiology first. Um, and I don't wanna to go too deep into this. So if you read the chapters, the um, platelet factor discussion and that diagram of the platelet, did that, did you look at, did, does anyone know which diagram I'm talking about? That's a very yeah, confusing. It's shocking i have no idea what they're trying to communicate with that diagram i went to um, youtube instead you had to youtube it good idea um, yeah I, I, I went to youtube to like learn that instead of i bailed on it and it was too confusing yeah absolutely so was youtube did you find any good resources on there on do you mean on like 
pl- our mean, playlists work. I did, yeah. I mean, but it was more. It was very similar to what you taught us already um, about like little factories on the playlist, that kind of thing. Oh yeah. So it wasn't this detail. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so the main thing to remember um, with platelets is that when there's an endothelial damage or when the subendothelial collagen is exposed, the platelets initially, they're, they're kind of just moving through the vessel, but they have to stick to the vessel. So particularly in, they call them high shear situations, like um, arteries and, and areas where there's really high flow. And I guess because ca- capillaries are quite narrow as well, things are moving through there. Um, the platelets have to sort of stick stick on the wall and they actually roll along a couple of times before they actually adhere permanently. Um, so adhesion, so the sort of initial sticking is one receptor and then the adhesion is another receptor and it doesn't actually matter what the receptors are called or anything like that. it's well beyond membership level. But just knowing that platelets kind of roll and then stick um, is important. And then once they stick, there's a whole heap of intracellular signaling um, pathways that are activated, which cause activation of the platelets and degranulation of the platelets. What, other than degranulation, what happens to the platelet once it's activated? It, it changes its um, like surface membrane to increase its um, surface area. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. And at a sort of more um, molecular level, switches its phospholipids from oh, yeah. the outside to the outside yeah. so that you can generate the, the um, factor factories, the thrombin factories on the surface. Um, so the main two receptors that I think are important, or two receptors, probably, yeah, I'm only going to talk about two receptors um, or two classes of receptors. One is the GP2B3A receptor which is the one that's responsible. It's activated by collagen and thromboxane and it's responsible for um, sustained aggregation with the platelets, so sticks the platelets together. And the only reason that that's important is because it's the target for autoimmune anti- autoantibodies. So that receptor is what the antibodies are targeted at, at to um, and that sort of marks them for dis- destruction, obviously, in IMTP. So it's just a nice extra thing. GP2B3A is the target for platelet autoantibodies. Um, and then the only other receptor I wanted to cover is the P2Y class of receptors. And there's a P2Y1 and a P2Y12. And the only reason they're important is that they are the target for clopidogrel. So clopidogrel blocks those receptors from being activated. So that means that you get decreased aggregation. So those P2Y receptors are receptors for ADP. So remember ADP turns into ATP and when it gets metabolized, try what is it? Phosphorylated, unphosphorylated, yeah. It turns into ADP. So that ADP is in the platelet granules. So when platelets degranulate, they release and they actually activate themselves. So they continue to kind of trigger that internal signaling pathway to maintain aggregation and activation. And the ADP obviously triggers other platelets around as well. So if you've got clopidogrel blocking that receptor, you might get the first platelet adhering normally because it's still got all the other receptors functioning but you're not going to get that wind up of other platelet recruitment activation and that ongoing sustained aggregation associated with the continued release of ADP. Does that make sense? Yep. That, that's as deep as I want to get today. The rest of the diagram, we're just all going to ignore completely. <laughs> um, can anyone tell me what the life expectancy of platelets are in circulation? 24 hours, I'm guessing. A bit longer. Like two days. Longer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Five days? Yeah, at, at pretty close. Yeah, so six to ten um, in theory. So neutrophils are hours, like less than 24 hours. They're the shortest lived cells in circulation. Then platelets, then the other white cells. Oh no, then red cells and then the other white cells. Um, so 
uh, platelet count will, like if you've got bone marrow to shut down completely, you'll only have a clinical thrombocytopenia occurring sort of six to 10 days after the fact. So just have a think about that. If you think you're dealing with a uh, syndrome of decreased production and it's a sudden bone marrow injury, for example, thrombocytopenia will be delayed behind in neutropenia. Um, can anyone tell me what stimulates platelet production? Thromboglutin. Excellent. Good. Um, can anyone tell me how platelets are manufactured? Sounds like the wrong word, but that's what I'm going to use. How are they produced? Um, I think the thromboglutin is from the liver and then it binds to existing platelets, which then they self-regulate their own production. So the more thrombopoietin, is that right? I have no idea. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. I, actually <laughs> meant, I actually meant like how to make eukaryocytes work. Oh, oh okay, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I assumed that megakaryocytes had receptors for thrombopoietin. I don't know. Maybe there is some peripheral like interaction with thrombopoietin. I'm not sure. Sorry. Um, I don't know actually how megakaryocytes are produced. It's so cool. Are they, are they the ones that like, I didn't read this, but are they the ones that have many platelets inside them and then they kind of rupture in a way and release like heaps of platelets? Yeah, pretty Something much. Like yeah. Can I draw you a picture? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Let me see. I'm going to just be messing around a little bit to try and make this work. I can't draw on my computer. Hang on. Um, you should be, there should be like a, um, do you have a whiteboard setting mm -hmm. on your machine? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure. I always see people do it in lectures and I don't know how they do it. Oh, 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 I think I've done it. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, all right. So megakaryocyte starts out as a cell in, it's a stem cell in the bone marrow. And my understanding, this is where I'm a little bit fuzzy, is that TPO binds the megakaryocytes and causes generation of microtubules. And that's microtubules part is really important. So the megakaryocyte all of a sudden starts producing microtubules and producing organelles and granules, heaps mm -hmm. of granules in there. Then the megakaryocyte changes shape just like a platelet does when it's activated. So those microtubules turn it into looking like a starfish and start the microtubules form these kind of like conveyor belts where the organelles that the platelets need and the granules that the platelets need get moved up into the tips of the starfish arms. Then once they're kind of full of granules and organelles, the microtubules rupture and the membranes squeeze in so if you see a megakaryocyte, which is about to release all its platelets, it looks like the arms look like this. And there's just these lines of platelets all together. So then it will release that platelet first, that platelet second, et cetera. Does that make sense? That's so clever. Yeah. So clever. So the reason why I want you to really remember the microtubules um, can anyone tell me the mechanism of action of vincristine? It's okay. about microtubules. <laughs> it supports <Okay>. them. <laughs> <laughs> Opposite. <laughs> it blocks them. It breaks them. Oh, so it okay. drops microtubules. So remember that um, like when cells divide, the mitosis, mitotic figure, where like you've got that kind of like this shaped thing and, and all those like bits, you know, do you remember this diagram? It's, I'm making it harder, I think. <laughs> when a cell is dividing <laughs> and all the <laughs> organisms. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Oh, no. You know when it's yeah, and all the organelles are moving into two poles and then the like cytoplasm is going to pinch around it. Yeah, like that. Yeah, gonna pinch around. One of those phases. Uh, not, well, it's a mitotic, it's, yeah, I can't remember which phase, mitotic phase, obviously. Um, 
So microtubules are what organelles move along. So in the setting of cancer, cancer cells are rapidly dividing. They're forming a lot of mitotic figures. If you disrupt the microtubules, then the organelle, the cell can't divide because it can't form that mitotic figure. So similarly, if you break down a microtubule that's heading up the middle of one of these arms of the starfish, then the platelets are going to break off more readily. So you get release of platelets in response to being Christine. Oh, makes that sense. makes sense. Because I said block them because I was thinking if you block them, they can't produce any more. Yeah. But that makes sense. They just produce them earlier than they normally they would. Earlier, exactly. Yeah. And that's where giving being Christine with thrombocytopenia is a bit of a contentious issue because if then the platelets aren't ready to be released. If they've still got an active microtubule in the middle, they're still moving granules and organelles up into the side of the, or into the platelet cell. So if you don't have all those granules and if you don't have all of the organelles the platelet needs to survive, the platelets aren't going to survive for as long and they're not going to be as active. So there's this kind of we platelet function is really hard to measure in domestic animals. We don't we haven't really nailed it, the testing of it, but there's this theory that potentially the platelet count that with the platelet increase we get with vincristine treatment of IMTP may not result in increased platelet function. It's just increased mm -hmm. platelet number. Okay, I'll get rid of that. Oh, I like this whiteboard function. That's a good discovery. Um, okay, so that is platelet development, how they develop. Um, we've talked a little bit about activation. What was the name of that receptor I want you to remember, which is the target for autoantibodies? EP2B3A. Excellent. I don't have a good way of remembering that. Can anyone think of one? Nope. No. Me neither. <laughs> we'll think of one. <laughs> we'll think of one. 2B3A. Awesome. Okay, let's move on to a patient with thrombocytopenia is presented and no, it's presented for a routine dental and you've done a CBC and there's a platelet count of 20. What are the kind of broad differentials of thrombocytopenia? Um, it's not really, I don't know if you would include this in your differentials, but I would if I had a, had a patient for a dental, um, like machine error. So I would do a manual platelet so count on a fresh draw. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so machine error, what are the other causes potentially of um, artifactual thrombocytopenia? If you have lots of platelet clumps. Yeah, absolutely. What causes that? Selection um, technique yeah. and cats. <laughs> and cats, cats cause clumps. Um, <clears throat> What about your collection technique causes um, activation of platelets? You've got like a really narrow needle. Um, sometimes that can cause turbulence and um, clumping, or if potentially yeah. the collection was not very smooth, um, smooth as stick. So potentially the cat or dog is jumping around. Yeah. And or you're kind of looking in and out and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So increased exposure of tissue factor due to increased kind of perivascular damage from poking around is going to increase platelet clumping or increase collagen exposure is going to increase platelet activation on the way out for sure. And the other thing that's interesting in the, I worked in the um, COAG lab at Cornell for three months and they holding up a vein creates turbulence, obviously as the venous return like kind of gets down to your thumb and bounces around, that actually causes turbulence. And that's even more so with a peripheral vein because it's a narrower area. So the sheer stress of turbulence and drawing through a narrow needle will cause platelet activation. So you're more likely to get clumps with that sort of collection technique. And sometimes that's what we have to do, obviously, particularly when we're suspicious of a thrombocytopenia. Um, we have to use small needles and things, but we we'll just be aware that your platelet count is probably going to be artificially lower on an automated machine than it would be otherwise. So always look for clumps in those patients. Okay, artifact, good. That's my category number one. Um, say again. Consumption. Consumption. Category. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Like 
if there's hemorrhage or an appropriate use for the platelets being used um, or more like an inappropriate, well, I guess it's technically appropriate, but like DIC. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Being used throughout the body. Perfect. That's category number two. And destruction. Good. Should be one. Excellent. And we're going to go into that in a lot more detail. So I'm going to leave that one there. Category number four. Breed associated, did you say? Like Cavaliers. How they have like mega carrot types. Very good. Excellent. Cavaliers and I'm going to push you. Cavoodles. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. Um, I think the Japanese breeds like Akitas. Oh, they have actually microcytosis and polycythemia rather than platelet. Oh, okay. Um, you're probably not going to get it. I'm going to tell you. It's greyhounds. They have. Oh, yeah, of course they do. Yeah. Yeah. Then, um, so cavoodles, not uncommon to see a cavoodle or ca cavalier or cavalier cross with a platelet count between 70 to 130 and they've got perfect clotting capacity. If you look at a smear, they're giant platelets. So if you're seeing giant platelets and a platelet count of 70, you can go ahead with your procedure um, with cavies specifically. Greyhounds just do their own thing. Um, and there's one more category. So we've done artifact, we've done sequestration or consumption, we've done destruction, we've done hereditary. Decreased production. Very so, good. Like bone marrow disease. Perfect. Excellent. All right. So that's all of our categories. And really the only one that's interesting to us is the increased destruction. So can we now look at the different causes of platelet destruction, please? The um, primary IMTP. Perfect. And then secondary IMTP. Pretty much. <laughs> so there are a couple of mechanisms of non-immune mediated destruction, but they're kind of like weird infections and, and things. So, and those infections obviously then can trigger an immune response. So it's not as clear cut as like IMHA where, or, or hemolysis, which is immune mediated or non-immune mediated. It's kind of, it may, may have started non-immune mediated, but it ended immune mediated. So. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the known triggers of, of immune mediated platelet destruction? Like use of drugs, like antibiotics, uh, yep. cancers, infectious disease that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, which antibiotics do you know? Mm, the Cloud, uh, TMS, sulfamide. Good. You've got all on my list, all of them on my list. So the TMS particularly associated with thrombocytopenia as opposed to IMHA, TMS is not documented in IMHA. Um, and the cephalosporin, so they've actually, it's not just a moxiclav, it's all of the beta-lactam antibiotics, um, which are the um, cephalosporins. Um, what about, while we're on drugs, what about vaccinations? Do they cause IMT? Textbook says yes, but I vaguely remember that's you're saying that's been kind of disproven. Yeah. Disproven. So that's why I asked that um, because there is a paper that was quite well done, which looked at the incidence of IMT with regard to like onset of vac um, uh, onset of IMT with regards to when the vaccine was last done, and there's no increased incidence within the 42 days after or six weeks after vaccination of IMT. So we can, I guess, we can kind of take IMT off the list. Although I have to say it's, it's quite a rare disease, so we probably need to get a bigger study group, like all veterinary studies, maybe the study size might have limited the conclusiveness of that. So Anna, when you're treating an IMT, do you warn the owners about further vaccinations or do you feel comfortable enough to say it's not related, it's just vaccinating, however? Um, 
That's a, a really good question. And I actually say don't don't vaccinate anymore, do titers and only vaccinate if you absolutely have to, if you're in a high risk area and stuff like that. And the yeah. reason for that is not because I think vaccine triggered the IMT in the first place or IMHA for that matter, but they've done a study, it's on JVIM, it's in JVIM, so it's open access if anyone wants to look it up, on the incidence of autoantibodies following vaccination. Oh, okay. So they looked at like, I think it was like 30 different autoantibodies. So anti-thyroid antibodies, anti-platelet antibodies, anti-red cell antibodies, like all of these autoantibodies. And vaccination triggered like close to 50% of the autoantibodies that they tested for were positive post-vaccine. So we know that vaccine triggers autoantibody production, but there's a lot of then safety nets in your normal immune system, which stops those autoantibodies from creating a, like actual autoimmune disease. But in a patient that has, we know, we've documented doesn't have those safety nets to prevent sort of autoimmune disease, then I wouldn't want to trigger an autoantibody response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, I found that a really interesting paper. And also it was a big sort of wake up call that autoantibodies don't necessarily cause autoimmune disease in every, like if you test tested and found antiplatelet antibodies, you'd think this is a slam dunk from thrombocytopenia or AMTP, but that actually might not be the case. So okay. it's not actually that specific for IMT. Um, okay, other triggers for IM, secondary IMT? Um, just on drugs, I had a cap on um, methimazole. Oh, a, right. yeah. Or IMTP. Yeah. That's rare in a cat as well, actually. Mm. Um, I guess then, um, like chemo agents, like carboplatin, can produce quite a profound. I don't, actually, no, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be immune mediated. That would just be it's direct bone marrow. Yeah. 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 Direct toxicity. But that's an interesting cause. Yeah, toxicity. Of yeah, that would be in the toxicity category. Yeah. Um, any others? Um, like inflammation. I think Max already said that though. Oh, did you, Max? Sorry, I missed that. Good. Oh, uh, <laughs> no, maybe yeah, not. Yeah, said inflammation, infectious disease, and neoplasia. Oh, great. Okay. Well, that's covered all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Max slam dunked it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just drop the mic and walk out, Max. That's done. <laughs> uh, I thought the... Um, the neoplasia section, probably, like I'd like to expand on that a little if that's all right, Max. Uh, <laughs> but um, I thought it was interesting because you sort of think of neoplasia, the causes of thrombocytopenia in neoplasia being bone marrow infiltration or myeloplasis is like a decreased production of platelets. But actually in lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma and histiocytic sarcoma, um, or the platelet bound antibodies have been identified. So there is actually an immune mediated component to thrombocytopenia in those conditions specifically. Um, and obviously hemangiosarcoma, there's a lot of platelet consumption from activation because it's exposed to endothelial damage. Um, but yeah, there's actually an auto autoimmune component as well, potentially. Um, and inflammatory diseases, which ones? Um, hepatitis. Good. Specifically Mine. relevant to the patient that we're seeing currently. Do you remember a little dog with hepatitis that was in recently? Oh, no. No. <laughs> <It's a bit laughs> of um, I was thinking of a cat that didn't have IMTP. No. Oh, wait, yes. Cycads. The cycad. Yeah. Um, the cycad dog. Yeah. Yes. I'm beginning to think it wasn't a psychiatric toxicity. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Well, I don't know. I guess the psychiatric toxicity could have caused hepatitis, which mm -hmm. could have caused the IMT, but we've got this little dog who had acute hepatitis or hep biochemical mm -hmm. hepatopathy, um, which actually re resolved quite well over the course of three or four days in hospital and now has a zero platelet count. Really exciting for the owners. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so hepatitis and other ones? Pancreatitis. Good. Yep. Systemic inflammation is the other one. Yeah. So the kind of big umbrella term for all inflammation, basically. 
Um, what about infectious causes, specific organisms which would cause an IMT? Um, Alikia. Good. Um, and like uh, Babesia, like tick-borne. Excellent. Cause it. There's one more I want. Um, Leptospirosis. Oh, yes. That is another one, but it wasn't on my list. But yes. Um, heartworm. Good. I don't have that on my list, but that's... I've got one more bacteria. Like a mycoplasma? Is that more... More hemolysis, yeah. Yeah, more hemolysis. Yeah. It's along that. Uh, like, what's the cat stripe bite fever? Um, the Bartonella? Oh. Uh, I think it probably can actually as well. I didn't have it on my list. There's one that's kind of similar category to Elikia in that we don't see it. Oh, yes, that's a really good one, but it's actually. What, what did you say, Josh? Lish maniasis. Oh, I've never seen maniasis. it, but nothing about it. So. <laughs> I don't think it's in Australia. It's exotic. No. Yeah. I think it's yeah, a big I always read it, it disregard it. <laughs> what did you say, Matt? I think it's in Europe, Leishmania, yeah. Yeah, so I've, I've had one case that came from Greece. So did a dog that had been imported. Um, and it was from beside Penny. <laughs> um, and it had terrible skin lesions. Um, so the last one is one that's in the Northern Territory. And it's one that because there's a lot of puppies coming through, we've just had our first positive Erlichia case at Northside. Um, so I think it's one that should be on our radars now that puppies are being imported from the Northern Territory. Um, anaplasma? Yes. Ah. Excellent. So anaplasma is the only one of those kind of organisms which will almost exclusively cause thrombocytopenia. So it actually is an infection of the platelets, um, whereas the other ones are infections of bone marrow or stem cells or like endothelial cells and things like that that cause um, platelet drops in the presence of other clinical signs as well. Yeah. Whereas anaplasma can be exclusively an IMT sort of syndrome. Um, and yeah, so any particularly young dogs or dogs that have been brought in from Queensland, Northern Queensland and Northern Territory should be screened for anaplasma if they have thrombocytopenia. Super. Um, okay. So what about if you've got a patient that comes in, I don't know how to word this. I'm just going to tell you. Um, so thrombocytopenia can be due to um, autoantibodies to the peripheral platelets or autoantibodies to the megakaryocytes. Clinically, what would you expect the difference to be? Um, would you find if it was of the peripheral platelets, you'd see like a very rapid drop in platelets. Whereas if you see, if it's megakaryocytes, maybe you would see kind of more of a gradual drop as those platelets drop off and die, but with no replacement. Potentially. That yeah. kind of, no, not what you're on about. Well, no, absolutely. That's exactly what would happen, but you'd be pretty fortunate to be monitoring the blood before it became clinical kind of thing. So you, yeah. that would happen, but you probably wouldn't see it. Yeah. Um, so once they've come in with uh, thrombocytopenia, what would you expect of recovery time? Seven days. Responding to corticosteroid. Yep, excellent. Um, if, is that peripheral or megakaryocyte directed? I guess that's peripheral. It is, exactly, yeah. So I sort of say, so megakaryocyte directed thrombocytopenia tends to result in a more profound thrombocytopenia, but obviously we so often see like I am a peripheral IMTP with a platelet count of under 10, um, but the average platelet count in megakaryocyte directed um, thrombocytopenia was actually four in one study. Um, the dogs tended to have a worse prognosis, but mostly because they were euthanized because of the duration of disease. 
So when I see a patient with thrombocytopenia, I usually say he's almost certainly going to be on the mend within seven days. So expect seven days hospitalization and potentially transfusions up to that point. But if they're not better by seven days, it's probably going to be three weeks. Thanks, Beth. Um, because peripheral thrombocytopenia responds pretty predictably to cortical steroids within that seven days. And if it hasn't responded by that point, three weeks is a really big commitment for an owner to be supporting their dog through a thrombocytopenia. Um, so yeah, if they're not coming good within 10 days, it's probably mega carrier site directed. And as long as the owners are committed, treat, treatment's exactly the same. It just takes a much, much longer time to redevelop stem cells than it does to redevelop peripheral cells. Uh, okay, so how would you treat thrombocytopenia? Um, withdraw drugs um, if there are any potential triggers involved. Um, if there, it says the textbook actually says to treat the infection first mm -hmm. before any kind of immunosuppressive therapy. Yeah. Because it might respond to that. Um, but then if that's not um, an option or if you've done both of those things, then um, with immunosuppressive therapy, so corticosteroids being the first one. Yep. Perfect. Um, and do you know when... <laughs> Are you found it? The plus or minus thing, Christine, as you were saying before, it's debated. Yeah, it's only really debated by me. Everybody else does it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've talked about how long we'd expect a it would take for a response with prednisolone alone, so six to eight days typically. What about with prednisolone and vincristine? What sort of time to normal platelet count? I think Christine works pretty quick, like within 24 hours, you see increasing platelet count. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you, have you seen the study where they looked at um, the average hospitalization time for dogs given prednisolone or prednisolone plus from Christine? Mm, I remember mm. that being a thing. Mm. <laughs> I'm sure I have that saved on my computer somewhere. Yeah. So it's average pred alone, 6.8 days, and pred and vincristine is 4.9 days. So uh, about, you save about two days hospitalisation by giving vincristine, according to this study. And, you know, you were saying that perhaps the platelet function isn't there, but mm. you're just having the numbers, which maybe makes you feel better about discharging them. Yeah. Was, is there any evidence that, um, like, their outcome is worse, like, that they have been discharged soon with poor platelet function? The outcome was the same, actually. Okay. Um, but obviously, the cost of 48 hours hospitalisation is massive. And if they can put that towards ongoing therapy, obviously, that's ideal. I guess my the thing that I'm a little bit wary of is most of these thrombocytopenic dogs have gastrointestinal bleeding. That's the biggest cause of life-threatening hemorrhage in these patients. And then Christine causes gastrointestinal side effects. So... Vomiting is a very traumatic thing for the gastrointestinal tract and diarrhea, you know, if you're going to kill off some of your enterocytes when you've got thrombocytopenia is not the time to do it. Yeah. Um, so I guess I wouldn't want a dog straining to defecate or anything like that if that was thrombocytopenia. Um, so that's kind of where, what I'm wary of. That's not, it doesn't affect hospitalization time. So obviously that's not like, it's not, it's not exacerbating bleeding in this, this study, yeah. but I, I'm just a little bit wary of that. So um, do you always give them like meropitin and esmeprazole and things if you're gonna use vincristine? And what are you um, probably, we probably should, but I don't always. Okay. Um, I, I actually, I don't use vincristine with my thrombocytopenic patients, but often okay. because we manage them between sort of the three medicine clinicians that we work with, mm. often they've had vincristine and yeah. Yeah, if they're not eating, I'd be using anti nausea medications, yeah. but not necessarily as a metrosome. Okay. Um, um, do you know from that study, Anna, if um, they use like pretty standard in Christine dosing as well? It's really low. Like Pono, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's lower than we use for chemo. So lower incidence of side effects as well. And in this study, I guess I'm wary of it because there wasn't that many dogs. They had like no side effects from Christine that were documented. 
Um, and I mean, I'm sort of sitting on my high horse going, being Christine causes gastrointestinal side effects, so does PRED, you know, like we do, we're doing what we can. Um, so there's no right or wrong there, I don't think. Um, at what platelet count would you be comfortable to discharge a dog? Hmm, 50? Yep. Someone say 30 and another clinician say 80? <laughs> yeah. Um, 50 to 70. Yeah. So at what platelet level is there an increased risk of spontaneous bleeding? I think 40. 30. Less than 40. Yep. So 30 to 40 is like written in the different um, resources. So anywhere around that mark, I would be quite comfortable to send them home. Um, it's interesting in the media at the moment, there's these um, clots that people are getting associated with um, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Oh, sorry, my dog's come to visit. Hang on. <laughs> oh, hi, toots. <laughs> okay. All right. Now we're ready. Um, oh, my gosh, it's so muddy. Why are you so muddy? Um, uh, what were we talking about? completely distracted <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, so these these are clots developing in the presence of thrombocytopenia so um there's sort of an immune mediated component i don't really know what the mechanism is but i think it raises a really good point that's talked about a lot in human field that we don't talk about but you can have a patient with four platelets and no no bleeding right like we see that that Quite often that they don't have a clinical thrombocytopenia and you can have a patient with 28 platelets who's hemorrhaging to death so the platelet number itself doesn't dictate the like obviously they're under 30 they're at increased risk of bleeding theoretically but when you actually do platelet function studies in humans some of these strong thrombocytopenic patients are highly hypercoagulable like they don't have an increased risk of bleeding they've got an increased risk of clotting so there's, they don't really know the mechanism of it, but there's a lot we don't understand about how platelets interact with sort of vessel walls and, and how they compensate when their numbers are low. And they can actually, you know, if you've got a patient that's got a platelet count of four, but is not clinically bleeding at all, then you might be quite safe to send them home. Um, but yeah, we've all had patients still bleeding at 30, uh, platelet counts of 30. Uh, and those are obviously the ones that we've got to keep in hospital. So my, whilst the number is really nice to go off clinically, I'd be much, I'd be much more kind of paying attention to the clinical um, picture. Um, what about IVIG, which is something you should write on your exam answers, but we don't tend to use very often. Um, I think it, the idea is it helps bind the um, macrophages. Mm -hmm. So you get less kind of, is it opsonization? No, that's the wrong one. Um, you, just, you just get less kind of, I think, targeting of platelets as a result. So you get a less overwhelming destruction overall. Exactly. Yeah. So the macrophages just can't bind to the auto, the platelet autoantibodies. So the Platelets have the autoantibody stuff on their surface and they're circulating and the macrophages normally bind to the pointy end of the antibody. But if you've given IVIG and saturated all those binding sites on the macrophages, they can't bind for platelet-bound antibodies. So um, decrease destruction. So that's a really good thing to decrease destruction and kind of facilitate a regenerative response. So the average hospitalization time in patients treated with Prednisolone and IVIG was actually 3.5 days, so much shorter than just prednisolone alone. Um, so if we could access it readily, you know, that's potentially the difference for us of like $3,000, particularly if we're talking about transfusions over the extra three days. Um, so you sort of think IVIG is super expensive, it's a waste of time, but actually if it saves them $3,000 in hospitalisation time, it's a very good investment potentially. Mm -hmm. So I want to look at, can I task one of you guys <laughs> with uh, looking at sourcing IVIG and what sort of prices and, and things we might be looking at? 
I think there's only one place in Melbourne they do that. I tried a couple of months ago. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, sorry, in Melbourne. Yeah, okay. And yeah. They, they ship it or? No, they said they don't do it. I don't know if it's because of COVID or because of some other reason. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And I could, they didn't tell me the price. Okay. That's annoying. Because they mm. use it in humans a lot, don't they? Yeah, I was yeah. just thinking yeah. from like the hospital. Hmm. That's what I was wondering. This is human stuff. We this is human IVIG, right? H I V I G. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So. Yeah. Um, so interesting to look into the price and, and availability of that because the last time I looked into it was probably eight years ago, and yeah, it's probably changed since then. <laughs> yeah. And can patients have um, a reaction, like an anaphylactic reaction to it? Is that common or not? Um, no, actually. Okay. No, human albumin is like high risk of reactions, but IVIG, I don't think so. I'd need to look into that. Um, so what about prognosis for a patient presenting with IMT? Uh, too bad. Pretty Very good in long term, I think. Okay. <laughs> Good in long term. What can you mean, like a, a figure, a survival figure? One study was ninety-seven percent. Great. Yeah. Um, so I think if you get them through the critical period and they start to respond, then they do quite well. Yeah. And I think the leading cause of death is euthanasia for financial reasons. So. Mm -hmm. if you know, obviously giving owners stats, if an owner is really committed to giving owners stats, including euthanasia rates, it's kind of off-putting, I guess, with survival times. So it's not, survival is like 90-ish percent. So when you look at the sort of average of all the different studies, um, so that's what I normally quote to clients. But I say to people, if they've not responded by day 10, the prognosis goes down really significantly. So mega carrier site directed um, IMT is much more um, serious. Is, is this same as IMHA? Like if it is a precursor target at IMHA, the prognosis is poor and the response time is longer? Exactly right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the response time is typically around about three to four weeks if it's mega carrier site directed. And in the study, obviously we haven't really documented, like we never do the test, bone marrow test, to work out whether it's mega carrier site directed or um, platelet directed in thrombocytopenia. But if in this one study where they did, only one out of seven dogs survived with mega carrier site directed, so much poorer prognosis theoretically. Seven dogs isn't really enough to draw a conclusion though. Do you ever want, do you ever worry um, that, you've, that, that, that you're missing like a trigger? Do you like go back and do like every infectious disease test under the sun and like full body imaging to rule out? Neoplasia, or I suppose that would have kind of that would maybe be part of your work up to start with if you were. Yeah, which we we didn't really talk about that sort of the uh, investigation, the testing that we do. Only because uh, I went with a dog. Um, this was not actually for IMTP. It was actually for it actually had a, a polyarthropathy, mm -hmm. but um, it just like didn't really respond that well. And then I kept thinking, I think I'm missing something. But and we did like every test under the sun, but then mm -hmm. it responded eventually. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, NBS, your, that would be part of your like diagnostic sensibly yeah. yourself. Usually, I think with IMT, the link with infection is kind of smaller than okay. IMPA. Okay. So it's probably a nice segue actually to just talk quickly about IMPA and the differences there. Do you know how, do you have a system for kind of classifying IMPA? Immune mediated polyarthropathy? Um, do you mean like the one like primary um, two, three, four? So they're like infection, mm -hmm. GI disease and neoplasia. Good, yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah. So the way I, there's just, there's a few different ways of doing it. Um, I don't know the one, two, three, four one, but I've got four, I've got four on my list. So I'm sure they're the same. <laughs> so pri there's primary. Um, do you know what primary means? Um, like immune mediated or? 
Yeah, exactly. And there's two subcategories of immune, of primary, IMPA. Um, the main difference is radiography. Oh, like erosive or non-erosive? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so they're the sort of primary ones. And then this is where IMPA differs from um, like IMT, for example, any excess of either antibody or antigen will cause an increase in antibody antigen complexes and they get just stuck in the joints. So anything that's causing chronic inflammation, so inflammatory bowel disease, neoplasia, particularly carcinomas, because they tend to be more inflammatory than other neoplasia, um, chronic infectious diseases, chronic immune mediated diseases. So anything that's going to result in either an increase in antigen or an in increase in antibody. So that's your secondary category. And then there's specific infectious diseases, which actually get into the joint and cause actual infections in the joint. So what are some of those infections? Do you mean, sorry, do you mean like systemic infections that could set off IMPA or specific to the joint? Um, so specific, specific to the joint. So there's a lot of systemic infections that will cause a secondary IMPA, like de deposition of immune, immune complexes. But there's actually the infections that cause polyarthropathy. So more than two joints having neutrophilic inflammation by definition. Um, Mike's plasma? Red, red, like salmonella? Salmonella, salmonella. potentially. Yeah, so I've got, I mean, I guess theoretically any form of septicemia mm. could do it because you're going to have circulation of organisms in through the joint capsule and once they get in there, they can't get out because there's su such poor circulation to those joints. So bacterial septicemia, salmonella being one. Um it's pretty much the same list as we had with IMT. So all of the tick-borne diseases, infections. There's an interesting section in the book about L-form bacteria. Does anyone remember that? Is uh, it? Are they the ones with a mutation? Yeah. If you have a bacterial wall mutation or something like that? Is yeah. That Exactly, yeah. So they're bacteria, like normal bacteria, that have mutated and lost their cell wall, which makes them not stain on a diff quick or a gram stain um, because it's normally the cell wall that takes up the stain. It makes them not able to be targeted by any antibiotics which target cell wall. So all of the cephalosporins and things are out. Um, and they're seen in cats and associated with skin abscesses and often cause a polyarthropathy, apparently. Mm -hmm. I was thinking this is not on my radar and it will be now. Mm -hmm. um, and then fungal infections, theoretically, like a German shepherd that presented with a polyarthropathy, I'd be concerned about aspergillosis. And then can anyone think of a cat virus which causes polyarthropathy? Oh. Please see virus. Good, excellent. It's a pretty safe answer in a cat. If something weird's going on, it's Khaleesi. That's interesting. Uh, I didn't know that. Mm. I've never seen it like what that. Was it? Sorry, I mean, my computer froze. What was the, the virus? Khaleesi. Khaleesi, cool. Yeah, we like to keep you hanging. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and the other thing that is sort of notable is that it's not uncommon to have a few days of post-vaccine IMPA, um, stiffness or joint pain in multiple joints. Uh, and that's because we've stimulated the immune system. We've got an increase in antibody and antigens, and therefore we've got deposition of immune complexes. And that's usually self-limiting over the course of a couple of weeks. You don't need to suppress their immune system. That's a natural kind of it's going to suppress itself after its initial response. Um, how do we diagnose it? Joint aspirates. Excellent. So they get a neutrophilic 
um, inflammation within the joints. I think greater than 10% neutrophils or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So what would we normally see with like degenerative joint disease or something? What cell type? Like a mixed inflammatory response. So I would assume. Yep. So it's normally um, mononuclear cells. I'm just trying to find. We had, oh, yes. We had a dog with I a might have to run in a second as well, Anna. Sorry. Oh, yeah. No, no worries. Thank you. Bye, Josh. Bye, Josh. Bye. I'll watch the rest later. <laughs> okay. So this is a dog that had an erosive arthropathy. Um, unfortunately, both of his carpi are affected. So it's really sort of difficult to sort of say, okay, well, that's normal, that's abnormal. But what, is, what stands out to you in these radiographs? So just swelling around the joint, Excellent. like all the tissue. Yeah. Yep. Anything else? There's loss of like nice smooth joint surfaces. I agree that all of those bones just look really stacked on top of each other to me. You've got like real increased like radio density like on your on the right or actually on both, but like on the right, um, you can see like just to the left of your cursor, there's like a real increased density where you're losing that nice smooth joint spaces. Yeah, no, absolutely. So here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's not your cursor. That's a picture. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah, absolutely. So erosive arthritis, you lose the articular cartilage. Mm -hmm. So the joint kind of collapses down on itself. Um, and then you get um, erosion, erosion of the periarticular bone as well. So these radiographs, Liz and I were sort of looking at going, oh, yeah, it doesn't look normal. Mm, this is a dog that presented actually not with joint pain, but with collapse of both carpi. So like hyperextension of the carpal joints. Um, and so we did these radiographs and we're thinking it doesn't look normal. And Mariana literally like walked past, looked sideways and goes, that's a erosive arthritis. Apparently they're really like pathognomonic, but I was like, this looks like weird dats in the arms to me. Uh, <laughs> so um, he, um, it, it, I might actually send these radiographs to him and get him to do a, a rounds on them just so he can point out exactly what's missing here. But um is radi radiologists will be able to pick it definitely get a radiologist report if you're suspicious of um joint laxity or joint pain um in and suspicious of polyarthropathy and that's probably actually all we've got time for so we might wrap up there has anyone got any specific questions about these topics or anything no uh, okay yeah <laughs> Many questions? No, yeah, I think recently I just saw a dog with the um, hemangiosarcoma sarcoma, actually, yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, it, it turns out, well, at the end, before it died, it started uh, having lumps on the, on, the, uh, on the body. Yeah. And the owner is kind of like, can I, can we aspirate it and have a look? And after I aspirate it, the dog start bruising and I took blood and it, Bruise again, so the dog becomes some bizarre opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, associated with hemangiosarc? I think so, yeah. The mm. the dog's hemangiosarc was a uh, stage three, so it's spread everywhere. Yeah. So it's in the know. liver, it's in the spleen, it's actually in the muscle. Mm. Um, the aspray that I did uh, came back with like small amount of spinal cells, so I believe there was metastasis. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Gosh, it's gone everywhere. Yeah, but I, I actually dealt with that. This is the first one I saw with uh, from mesothelioma or bleeding disorder. Yeah. So normally with hemangiosarcoma or like the consumptive form of thrombocytopenia associated with hemangiosarcoma, I wouldn't really expect the platelets to be below like 60. Mm. It's, they're normally not kind of clinically symptomatic for their thrombocytopenia. But obviously that one sounds like it had the immune mediated component on top of mm. the um, consumptive component. Yeah. Are you guys ever running D-dimers anymore? 
Oh, I think they used to. I talk about that, but then Vetnostic doesn't do that anymore. Vetnostic doesn't. No, we used to take it to Palms actually, just because it's local. Mm. Um, and the methodology they're using is um, the same as what we'd use in dogs. Okay. Um, I've got, I did a whole bunch of dogs while I was at North Shore. Um, so I've got kind of normal ranges I'd have to look up for you. But if you wanted to run them, you could run a sample over to Palms. So D timer is to check if there's a sign of hyperfibrinolysis. Uh, yeah, exactly. So yeah. what it sort of indicates is that there's increased clot formation. So if you've got increased fibrinolysis, you've, it's because you've got increased clot formation. And in this dog, it's kind of academic interest. We assume if it's got dis diffuse hemangiosarcoma, it's going to have platelet consumption, increased clot formation. Mm. Um, but I guess it would just be interesting to see what sort of, like if you could use that as a measure of... Um, the degree of disease potentially mm. it's quite spectacularly mm. elevated sometimes in these dogs is a uh, those um tech machine i can't remember the name now the full name it, is it going to help us to determine if the disease is getting worse as in there's uh, a period of time hypercoagulable and then once you finish you become hypo potentially um so this is the, the trouble with all of these. So it's such an academic interest thing. Like mm. it's not actually going to change prognosis outcome. Like we might be saying, oh, we're getting closer to the end, but kind of mm. we're three months in with hemangiosarcoma. Of course we are. Mm. Um, so I reckon the big indication of fatigue will be in the perioperative kind of period. So say we've got a splenic, suspected splenic tumour and we do a TEG and they're hypercoagulable. And we sort of say, okay, well, it's probably involving the blood vessels. We've probably got some activation of clotting within the spleen. Let's take the spleen out and then measure what happens with the coagulability after surgery, whether we need to use anticoagulants or whether we need to um, be monitoring for bleeding potentially. Hmm. I think that's probably more of an indication. Okay. Yeah, no, that one didn't do too well. <laughs> no, I can imagine. Yeah. Right. Any oh. other questions? No. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. No worries. Cheers, Max. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye. See you soon, Helen. Bye. Bye, Toots. <laughs> He's out. <laughs> Bye. Bye.